Coming up, Alaska, where the U.S. Census begins. In the state with the largest landmass, the most scattered population, and the hardest to count. It is imperative for our people to be counted in our villages, in our regional hubs, and in our cities. Why Alaska Natives have been historically undercounted. There are communities that don't understand what these programs do. They've become left out. Ahead, what's being done to make sure all Alaskans are counted? Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers, with challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief that the best is yet to come, bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to our program. The U.S. Census is definitely a frontier in our state. It happens once every 10 years, and Alaska is the very first place in the nation to be counted. On January 21st, it all starts in Tuxuk Bay, a Yupik-speaking community in southwest Alaska that overlooks the Bering Sea. Census workers have already begun outreach efforts conducted mostly in Yuktun, but that's not the only Alaska Native language census workers have been trained to use. You'll hear sounds from several groups of native language speakers. The Gwich'in, the Inupiat, the Koyukon, and the Yupik. Rochelle Adams hopes this workshop will lead to an improved census count. It's just amazing. I don't know if I've ever seen anything like this, you know, where we have this cross-cultural sharing. As part of that sharing of cultures, Tristan Madras of Caltag sings a French hymn in his Koyakon Athabascan language. And while the languages are different, everyone here is on the same page when it comes to the power of language and culture. It's something that we all enjoy doing and it comes natural for us to work together because we have that common ground of knowing that our languages are important. I think it's more than census. It's about establishing uh, a relationship statewide. Alaska is one of the most complicated landscapes for the census in the United States and expensive to count. Overall, Alaska has the lowest census response rate in the nation. The 2010 census also estimates that 8% of Alaska Natives were not counted. With small populations scattered across vast areas and no road system to connect communities, it's easy to miss people. Alaska's many different languages and cultures make it a bigger challenge. Here's the thing. Richard Attuk warns that the language glossaries the group has developed here don't take into account all the different dialects and expressions, like this greeting in Inupiaq. And they don't know what to think because actually what that means is not just a good day, it's a very good day. It's really interesting when we look at um, how our language is adapted. Alaska Natives who speak very little English might not fully understand the intent of the census and even view it with skepticism. When I hear and see that we're doing the language piece of it, it it's more meaningful. I'm glad we had these cross-cultural dialogues because it really opened up a lot of um, opportunities. Like the creative use of language and culture to promote understanding. Cheryl Charles Smith records a public service announcement in Yupik. In it, she talks about the need to improve upon Alaska's response rate. That old saying about putting your money where your mouth is, 
seems to hit home because the census determines how much federal money Alaska will get and what share each community will receive. If there are communities that don't understand what these programs do, they've become left out. And so I think this is a really great movement that um, that will catch fire. That phrase, catch a fire, struck a chord with Rochelle Adams, who says it reminds her of how women used to pack fire on journeys so they could have it every place they camped. And so when you think about that, we're still continuing to carry that fire with us. Plenty of enthusiasm has been sparked to be carried on a community to community journey that happens only once every 10 years. Well, the census is worth a lot of money to Alaska. Based on past counts, Alaska receives about $3 billion a year, money that's used for a range of government services from health care to education, roads and public safety, as well as public assistance. The census also determines representation in our state legislature. Based on population changes, the 2020 numbers will be used to redraw voting districts so that each district has the same number of Alaskans. And in the last census, urban Alaska picked up more legislative seats while rural Alaska lost ground. Up next, the importance of an accurate count, and we'll be joined by Donna Bach, an outreach worker for the Census Bureau, here to tell us why there's more at stake for Alaska than you might think. The history of the census in Alaska goes back to 1870. The U.S. Army conducted the first one, which was under the command of Major General Henry Halleck. His count turned up 82,400 people, but that number was not considered reliable because population estimates for tribes were far from accurate and, in some cases, made up. In the archives at the University of Alaska Anchorage Library, we found a curious story as told by Reuben Gaines, an Alaska radio legend. In a recording, he tells a story of a Guy Stocklaker, who was hired to take the Alaska census in 1900. Gaines says Stocklaker traveled mostly in the winter by dog team, and his experiences range from harrowing to hilarious. Yet the toughest part was not the territory, but the people. It was, in fact, the Alaskan swearing that most impressed Stocklaker. Of all the adventuring during his pursuit of the census, he declared that this country was by far the worst in the world for the quality of its language. One of the chief troubles was with lone men on the trail, who also had to be counted. Many, for one reason or another, wanted strictly to be left alone, and unless they were personally acquainted, the census taker was subjected to flagrant abuse. There was apparently no way to stop cussing, so he solved the problem by naming his dogs with the familiar four-letter words. And thus he mushed all winter without offending his conscience. Even as late as the 1940s, a lot of the census work was carried out with the help of dog teams. Among those recruited to take the census, teachers, school superintendent, tenants, and prospectors who had to start early before the snow melted. And the trails were still in place. <laughs> well, although things have improved for census takers, even in 2020, Alaska still is one of the most challenging places to conduct the census. And joining us now to talk about that, Donna Baca, Tribal Partnership Specialist with the Census Bureau. Donna, you know, this story is, is just a reminder of how challenging it is in Alaska. I know it's better, but is it still pretty difficult? Yeah, I think we've come a long way from having to conduct the census by dog team and of course we have now modern ways with aviation carriers to um, rely on but we know that inclement weather and Arctic conditions can still create many variables and challenges but uh, I have to applaud the recruitment efforts uh, by the Anchorage Census Office has been to strive to hire locally as much as possible so that we can get trusted members of the community to help be employed to do this important work. You know, it's still one of the most expensive places in the nation to conduct a census, and, and yet, you know, the forms apparently go out in the mail uh, to a lot of rural communities, uh, but the response rate is apparently one of the worst in the country. Well, uh, I think it just 
speaks to the remote geography of Alaska, the variables of getting out to our 180, you know, displaced communities that aren't on the road system. Uh, you know, we have communities that are far from hub communities. We have unreliability sometimes in our mail delivery. But what's exciting about uh, the count in remote Alaska is that most people in small villages will get a knock on the door, hopefully by someone that they know from that village, to answer the very simple 10 questions because it's safe, it's easy and important, and it will help, I think, secure hopefully federal funding for the next 10 years for our state. You know, Alaska, though, is kind of a skeptical place about government intrusion and, and these questions. I guess there's a worry about giving information to the government. Yeah, you know, there there is a worry, but I think to assuage that worry, we we as Alaskans actually share more information when we apply for a permanent fund dividend than we do in the 10 question, uh, in, the, in the census questionnaire. And these are kept confidential, the Extremely answers. Extremely confidential. We take an oath for life and we risk five years of imprisonment or, or over a quarter million uh, dollars if we disclose or share any of that information. So I, I, ha I have uh, dug up some archival footage here uh, with help from KYUK and Bethel. This is their footage. Uh, Summit Day Media has recently digitized this, but this is uh, downriver from Bethel. I mean, this footage really kind of tells the story, the census workers going out in a community off the road system. Yeah, and you know, in my role as partnership specialist, we try to secure partners with tribal governments, with regional tribal health nonprofits, with uh, you know, healthcare systems and cities or municipalities to help support and elevate the success of the census takers as they do their work. Well, you know, these these workers, and you can kind of hear the audio under there if you listen to it, they're talking about getting this done before breakup. <laughs> yeah, it's intentional by design to conduct the, uh, the count in Alaska before breakup. So our window to get the count starts January 21st and hopefully have most of the, the knocks on the door done by the end of March. Well, we have some uh, photos from Jimmy Lincoln of Tuxuk Bay he shared with us to give people a sense of what the first community in the country is like that's going to be counted. Why was Tuxuk Bay cho chosen? I think it's such a beautiful community. Uh, I think it speaks to the remoteness of the Alaska Native, um, you know, remote community that's near a regional hub. But I think it's also a beautiful community that has really held fast to their traditions, but also, you know, contemporary opportunities. And um, they're very excited, I think, to roll out the welcome for uh, Director Stephen Dillingham when he comes to do the he's first He's the National Census Bureau Director. <laughs> yes, yes, he's planning on being in Tuxuk for... Now, some people have wondered if this is kind of just for show. Uh, it's, it's, if it is, it's for a very important reason. And it's a, it's, it's, I think it's just mandated by the Constitution that we obligate ourselves to be counted. And the benefits far outweigh, outweigh the risks. Well, one of the things about Tuxuk Bay is they've got, got some interesting people <laughs> living in that community. And one of those is Jimmy Lincoln's relative, Noah Lincoln. And he's got a, a Facebook uh, phenomenon here going. Uh, they have a page, and they're known for their slapstick comedy page, Noah Loves Christie, and their videos definitely reflect a distinctly Yupik sense of humor, like their duct tape commercial. <laughs> So let's take a look at that. Is your snow machine falling apart and you don't have time to fix it? No problem. Just use duct tape and your snow machine will be good as new. Broken handle on your coffee mug? No problem. Just use duct tape and you'll be enjoying your coffee every morning. Are you always losing your satellite remote and you always look everywhere to find it? Well, look no further. Just duct tape the remote to your hand and you'll never miss your favorite show ever again. Do you have overly active children who can't sit still? Well, you can use duct tape and duct tape them anywhere in the house. Warning, duct tape should not be used as advertised. This is just a clip from, the rest of it's funny if you go to their Facebook page. But when you, you know, you flagged this for me just to kind of show me uh, give me a sense of Tuxuk Bay. <laughs> uh, well, Noah Loves Christy has a huge following, and I think the beauty of uh, not only the traditions and the contemporary and the embracing of humor or teasing in the Yupik culture is a beautiful aspect that I think transcends 
any ethnological identification. <laughs> but you know, Tuxuk is this interesting mix of traditional, but also they're very progressive. I mean, here they are using social media. <laughs> yeah, they have like 30,000 followers. So if we can get every one of those followers to do the census, we're winning. <laughs> <laughs> so just in wrapping things up here, you know, what do you hope will happen this time? Because, you, because Alaska's population has declined according to the Department of Labor's own numbers. Uh, you know, that really makes the census count even more important because yeah. we're going to lose some ground potentially. We, I think we just want to, you know, ensure that Alaska can be eligible for as much of its federal money and its fair share as much as possible. And the way that I look at this census is a solution-based initiative that can hopefully carry Alaska forward for the next 10 years. And it's, it's an opportunity to think about the future um, and understand that it's safe, it's easy, important, and, and it, 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 it takes 10 minutes, it's 10 questions, and impacts 10 years of funding. All right, well, I want to thank you very much, Donna Bach, for giving us kind of a preview of what's ahead for us in Alaska and why it's so important. Well, coming up, what will the head of the U.S. Census Bureau find when he heads to Tuxuk Bay? An only in Alaska community where family, culture, and tradition are the glue. When the Alaska Census kicks off, on Tuesday, January 21st, Tuxuk Bay will be in the national spotlight. And joining us now, Mark and Jolene John, both born and raised in Tuxuk, but you now live in Anchorage. Do, do you get homesick for your community? No, not not so much. Uh, there's times of the seasons when uh, we like to get home and participate in uh, subsistence activities, and also festivities that take place. The Wachbuck is a big one. And then also uh, Blackberry Festival in early September. Yeah, I can see where that would be uh, something very special to get out and berry pick. How about you, Jolene? For me, harvesting the berries and other things that grow and that are ripe are important for me to go back home and gather them, bring them here to Anchorage where I can share with the rest of the family and friends. Well, thanks for kind of giving us a sense of, of what what this first community in the nation to be counted is is like. Maybe you could share a little bit about the history of, of Tuxuk. In 1964, just about half of uh, Nightmare moved to Tuxuk Bay. Um, by That's Don another Bering Sea community. Mm -hmm. It's in river, uh, in the Tuxuk River. So um, why did they have move? Uh, part of it was to lack of um, land to build more homes and also accessibility of barges to get in and out safely. So, so Tuxuk is a composite community of different villages in that region. Uh, and I guess, you know, your father is probably someone that we should mention here, Paul John, who was a, a leader. You know, I've met Paul, and I have never heard him speak a word of English. Every time I saw him, he always spoke in Yupik. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, why your father had such an impact on the region? He, he was... Uh... Uh, um, a leader that really pushed uh, traditional culture, and he pushed for um, our cultural activities to uh, continue. And also, he wanted to help the communities build infrastructure so that they can be more comfortable. Well, he was given an honorary doctorate by the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And I, and I also want to show a picture of your two sisters. Uh, this was taken at a graduation ceremony for Agatha John. She received a doctorate. And, of course, Teresa had already had hers. So basically now in your family, you have three doctorates mm. from one village, one family in Tuxuk Bay. Jolene, what does this say about Tuxuk Bay? Well, I think it really shows how much our elders valued both the traditional knowledge as well as the modern education. So we were pushed to go on to uh, get our degrees and be involved and active members in a community. 
And uh, that goes to show how much our father pushed us to get our education and be involved. So we have also have some photos uh, from Jimmy Lincoln to show you. He's from, from Tuxuk Bay, a wonderful photographer. And they kind of showcase uh, the traditions of, of Tuxuk Bay, how important they are. Do you think that, that that was part of why Tuxuk Bay was chosen to be the first for the census, is that it's a mix of modern yet traditional? We'd like to believe that the teaching of our ancestors, our elders, have really continue to thrive among the population in the community, even for those of us that may have moved away. We value our language. We like to continue our subsistence hunting and harvesting so that we thrive in, in today's world. What do you think your father would have thought about the census coming to Tuxuk Bay first? I think he would have been very happy about that. Um, it's, um, Tuxuk is a, a, a community where everybody likes to participate, and p p that's part of a teaching, to be always to be a part of activities that take place. Would you say that phrase again? To be a part of, to be seen, and uh, that uh, encourages community involvement and participate in, participation in things that take place. How do you think uh, people are going to uh, do with the census? Do you think that we'll see a good response in Tuxuk with all this attention? <laughs> I'm encouraging and I'm, I'm encouraged by the uh, comments that I hear from the rural communities today, especially from my hometown, who know that it's important to be involved, to be counted because once you're involved, then more things can be reaped from having the statistics on paper because that's what's important for a lot of funding agencies and um, grant supporters is that statistics really show what uh, the community needs. Well, I, I want to show uh, uh, this, this photograph of a young man named Byron Nikolai. He is a... a a rap artist. He raps in Yupik, and, and this is one of the catch phrases in a song that we're going to hear soon. Can you uh, say that for us, read that for us, and tell us what it means? My Wee Jung said, which translates to, I do not make mistakes, I only learn. And that's kind of got a deep meaning. I mean, it's sort of like you, you shouldn't feel bad about your mistakes so much if, if you see them as an opportunity to learn. What does that say? Well, I think in our traditional teachings, we've always, always been told that we need to understand the ramifications of the mistakes we may make, but to also realize what can change in a positive manner uh, they used to tell us this road will lead you to this path. If you take this path, it'll lead you to this consequence. And so it was always brought to our, our individual decision to do what's right for us. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jolene and Mark John. And we're going to leave you now with photos from Jimmy Lincoln set to the music of Byron Nikolai, a magic combination. Thanks for joining us. Allah.